it feels much more intuitive to yeah. look at an individual card and go, oh, that's like the ambassador for my deck. <gasps> Destruction makers. On this channel, we have been accused unjustly, I think, of being critical of Commander. Unjustly? Yeah, we're not. Look, we strive to understand how a, a, a system can create an outcome, right? By being critical of it. You, of course. I mean, you have to analyze it. But we're not doing so to, ma to, to uh, remove anyone's enjoyment of Commander uh -huh. or to make anyone feel lesser for playing Commander. Right. And so today, I think what we should talk about are the top three things why Commander's great. Take a deep breath. <laughs> so before we talk about the best parts about Commander Magic, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, also, we have a Discord if you're interested in joining our community. And this video is also brought to you by... My Kickstarter is now live. Uh, it went live August 15th, and it will end August 29th. Uh, Kickstarter's for my five-color playmat series that you should be seeing on the screen. Ooh, the magic Ooh, of editing. Woo, woo, woo. Uh, yeah, so the uh, link to that is in the description. And uh, back to the video. So we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about three of the things that make Commander great. Yeah. One is uh, how it had it's given Wizard of the Coast an inroad directly to the casual uh, players. Yeah. Two is that it creates a new uh, way to deck build, which is really really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and third is that it creates a new way for a player psychographic to interact with the game. Uh, previously, the socializer was not able to play the game while socializing in the same way that Commander has made that possible. Right. Something I think is really interesting, I think that kind of connects to this, is that Mark Rosewater recently talked on his uh, Drive to Work podcast uh, about how one of the most difficult things Magic has ever had to do is try to make sure that they are bringing new players in. Yeah. Um, at a rate ideally faster or at the very least the same as which players are falling off the game. Right. This is the churn rate, which right. we have an episode about. And so he, in the podcast episode, he's talked about like, you know, a few different ways. And basically they've come that, uh, come to the conclusion that Magic Arena currently is their way of doing this, of introducing players, um, especially to the standard format. But what I think they sort of stumbled into um, is that, Commander, I think, has actually worked as a great entry point for uh, players to come in and enjoy the game. Um, so much so that I think many people end up going into Commander not realizing that this game is actually 30 years old and has right, yeah. many <laughs> other formats to it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that, yeah, it has offered a sort of low stakes, uh, casual environment uh, that is easy to hop in and out of over years even uh, as you are playing and deciding how much you want to invest time uh, or financially into the game itself um, that is more so than any other format offers. Right, and we've talked a little bit about this before in uh, like previous videos where uh, sort of the design incentives of Wizards of the Coast had been focused on tournament play. Right. And it's mainly because that was the best way that they could get feedback from players. It's that, I mean, we're talking like the days before the internet, right? In that um, there wasn't, a, it wasn't all that easy to survey the player base. You could do it, but it was like, you know, pretty hit or miss. And so the, the best roads that you had to know whether or not you were doing a good job was sales of product and uh, tournaments. In that tournaments, you got direct feedback from players in terms of how good a set was, um, and how you know how enjoyable the tournament experience was, how many people signed up to tournaments. There's all these sort of data pieces, you know, uh, pieces of data that fall off um, from the interactions that players are having, and so um, there really wasn't a a clear way to say. Um, how the sort of majority of the players were enjoying the game. Um, and so then we start moving into, uh, you know, when Commander shows up and we, we start seeing Wizards go, oh, well, let's make a, a product specifically for that audience. Uh, in was this 2011 when did the first decks come out i think 2011 somewhere around 2012 20, yeah, yeah. sure so so we'll I'll, we'll put on screen what it is or whatever to make us look right or wrong i don't know oh, okay. so <laughs> um and so we start to see them embrace uh making a product that is directly catered to a, ca a casual audience in that um 
you know, the, these uh, initial theme decks come out, and I'm uh, I'm assuming they did it way better than what they expected them to do. Right. And so we start to see Wizards um, supporting both of these formats for a period of time, right? We still have sort of the legacy, legacy, not legacy the format, legacy product line being the tournament-focused stuff. But um, <clears throat> we also see sort of the creation of the the current social media ecosystem of, of Commander hmm. in that you're, you're, you're seeing more ways for Wizards to be able to uh, get information about how well uh, player bases enjoy the game yeah. um, through different means. Um, and one of the things that Mark Rosewater has said before is that the majority of players are casual players and they never touch it. They never come to a tournament. Kitchen table magic. Right. It, it's like 10% yeah. of players ever play in a tournament. And so when you have a game that's built around that, you know that like the top end of the game is doing great, right? right? You see everything and how it's going, or you know, you know how well it's doing. Sometimes it's not doing as well, but whatever. Uh, you know that if players are playing most optimally, the game is fun, right? But then the question becomes: Is it fun when players aren't playing it most optimally? And are players that aren't interested in high optimal play uh, are, are those players interested in the game from the outside, right? Like, is it always just about? trying to go and be the tournament player and win, you know, and be super optimal, or is it just, does it look fun from the outside to a casual person? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, when we look at the 1v1 nature of the game and the free-for-all four-player commander uh, version, yeah, we sort of see uh, a dichotomy that's different than, like, a, a board game uh, type of audience, right? Where 1v1, <clears throat> it's very, you know, me versus you. It's either your turn or my turn. Uh, and then when we start moving into sort of the the, the board game space, which is, uh, you know, I think there's no mistake that it has been uh, a rise in popularity of that type type of gameplay that yeah. coincides with the rise of Commander. Um, you see a much more sort of welcoming, inclusive in terms of like everybody gets to play the game together right. type of environment. It's more of a casual game night, right? right. Where it, previously there obviously there were people that they'd get together and they'd have their own night of playing magic or whatever with their friends, but it's a lot of individual games going on. Mm -hmm. Now you could have one pot of players and, uh, and you could just all enjoy that or you could ha add another one, right? You could have a five, six player commander sure. game or whatever, uh, because it, the format uh, allows for that. Right. Okay. So, so creating that inroad to a casual audience um, I think it was extremely important and is probably what has led to Wizards doing as well as it's doing now. Yeah. It gave the game uh, a, a sort of a refresh because of the higher life totals. Uh, any type of power creep that was immediately sort of reset. Yeah. That's sort of changing now. But at the time, it was like, oh, well, we've got sort of all this headroom now because life totals have doubled individually and now you're playing against so many more opponents, it's a, it's a six times increase in the amount of uh, life total we have to, to deal with. Right. So it actually allowed them to even uh, just attract other players by saying, like, look, we can we printed this super crazy good card. You could never play this in 1v1, but you can play it in Commander. Isn't that fun and exciting and wild? Right. And Yeah. And, and sort of getting to those higher mana counts. And, and yeah. we had this really interesting dichotomy uh, between uh, cards that wouldn't see, like, really were just not, cost effective to be played in tournament magic there, yeah. there was sort of this this like uh no man's land right where like there were these cards that were printed that were really interesting and just didn't have a home right. because the games didn't go on long enough for you to get to them and that was the real appeal i think from commander from the from the jump yeah and i think this is a perfect segue to start talking about deck building sure and how commander offered uh new ways for deck construction obviously the format offers its own unique uh limitations to deck construction by having a commander and having to have limited colors and all of these things to it. Right. So that in itself was exciting. And I also think that having a commander um, as a way to sort of introduce deck construction yeah. to a casual audience is way more effective than yeah. standard magic. It feels much more intuitive to yeah. look at an individual card and go, oh, that's like the ambassador for my deck, yes. right? That is the leader of my deck and the rest of my deck is built uh, in under the theme of that commander, yeah. under the colors of that commander, it, it to me it's this is the this is the genius of commander. Yeah. Previously, it was always sort of you are the commander, you the player are the commander in this abstract sense. In this deck, is your deck that you are controlling as that person. But like, I don't think that 
people necessarily attach themselves like that, right? I think that adding that extra little bit of like almost an avatar that you are controlling or that is uh, that you are embodying. Um, obviously, this has seen a lot of success. A lot of new games within the last handful of years have also started to do this and introduce their own sort of like commander um, in in the gameplay. I think because of uh, how easy it is for players to become very attached to a singular character and want to embody that particular card or in doing so embody that particular play style. Right. And it's actually really interesting because <clears throat> Magic tried to do this with its previous format through the Planeswalkers. Right. Right. They were like, well, we want sort of these iconic characters. And they had legends before that were what their attempts at making these sort of iconic characters, but they don't connect in the same way that the Planeswalkers did. Yeah. And then what's, I, I think, maybe ironic is that Commander sort of sy systemically creates this elevation of a, of a particular card type, which happens to be legends, which are iconic. Yeah. I think it all sort of like lines up into making these, uh, into the new characters of magic and right. so which we're seeing now right even. and and yeah. when we think about like uh you know the role that planeswalkers were supposed to serve they sort of have fallen away you know in, in a certain way to make way for commanders yeah um right so so um i think yeah just tons of advantages in terms of um putting together a deck that feels um it's not like something you are identifying with like you said you're sort of seeing yourself in your commander uh and then it, it is also giving kind of a shorthand to help narrow down the possibility space of all of the cards in existence of magic, right? Right, because instead of it being, you technically can run a red deck, but maybe you want a little bit of blue or a little bit of white or whatever. Instead, it's just saying like, okay, you like that commander? Well, that commander's just red. So there, yeah. it's just red cards. That's all you can use. It's actually interesting because I do wonder if there's more there uh, in ter to be explored in terms mm. of like how a commander limits the card pool. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, that's something I like. There's sort like of maybe just you can use <laughs> white sorceries or something like that. Like it's yeah, uh, yeah. Or or you limit it to the set that that commander's from. Yeah. Or something like we've I, talked about. We've that talked idea about. Yeah, I think that would be a great design space it could for them be to super, get into. Uh, super interesting. Yeah, especially uh, in an eternal format, saying you can only use cards from this plane or whatever. Right. And and some of this happens uh, anyway with the precons, right? So right. So when a precon is is built, they're basically using mostly cards from that set. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so uh, yeah, let's get into the the what might be the most important uh <clears throat> and most uh maybe overlooked um best part about commander. <laughs> I think so. I I think it, in my opinion, it's probably the uh, most overlooked. Uh, is that yeah? I mean, previously, I feel like there's always. There's there's the psychographics that Magic players are familiar with uh, that Mark Rosewater sort of started to introduce to players um, and how they started designing specific cards for the game. Um, and there was always sort of Vorthos was the psychographic that I think was closest to the embodiment of someone that uh, enjoyed the game for reasons outside of the gameplay itself. Sure, yeah. Um, but I think that even beyond that uh, it is going to get game design nerd space so that's, i apologize that's what we do <laughs> um but there's uh there's something called bartle's taxonomy mm -hmm. uh bartle's taxonomy was uh a, another psychographic chart uh designed by richard bartle i think is his first name um designed by Bar bartle yeah, mr bartle a lot of richards in I game know, design a lot of richards i wonder what's up with that so old dick bartle <clears throat> um <laughs> don't don't stop just keep going uh so uh he uh he designed these psychographics uh, based off of muds, uh, old school muds, and he uh, pinpointed uh, each different psychographic not so much on player uh, behavior and what they felt like doing, uh, or like uh, their sort of emotional impact and what resonated with them, but more so what they did do in the game. Right. So it's the physical actions, not how they're feeling about those actions. Yeah. Uh, but one of those corners is uh, called socializer. Mm. And socializers were people that might not even really play the game, but they yeah. love talking about the game. Yeah. And they also just like being a part of the inner circle of people that are discussing that game. And what Commander sort of created the opportunity uh, for was for people that might consider themselves to be in that socializing space 
uh, to be able to actually engage in the game now. Whereas previously, you might have a, uh, a night where you're all hanging out playing Magic, you got a bunch of 1v1 games going on, and you have one person that they're sort of sitting out of a game. And in which case, that one person, if they're kind of socializing, you can't really talk to the person that it's doing they're doing their turn because they're thinking they're trying to win whatever so you're talking to the other person but they're also kind of in the game so they're trying to pay attention to what the other person's doing and it was never sort of clean um but now you have this whole pot of people that because it's more casual and because there's more opportunities for uh different conversations to be brought up or whatever you have this space that allows a socialized uh, a socializer i guess archetype of a person yeah. to actually be able to engage with people in ways uh, while playing the game right and you know i think the the sort of best way to kind of sum that up is like when it's a 1v1 environment it's always somebody's turn right so right. so it's either my turn or it's your turn there's no room really to socialize about the game in that environment right it's much more about the game itself yeah and when we move to a you know uh four player free for all environment it's one person's turn and three people are not taking a turn right. which gives a lot of room for conversations to happen between those three people that's a way better way of summing it up i yeah, mean yeah. Yeah, it's, i rambled it's all right yeah, it's, it's <laughs> So uh, it, it gives space for these socializer uh, archetype players. And honestly, you know, I don't think that the psychographics should be so like, you're this or you're this. Right. I think everybody has... Everyone's you know, a little bit of something. Right. And, yeah. and so, you know, I think that's par you know, part of what Commander Illuminated is that there are these players who feel like, okay, well, yeah, I, I want to have a conversation here. Like, I don't want to take yeah. this game so seriously. I don't want the game to be the primary focus of my evening. The game is a means of social interaction. Right. Which, honestly, in 1v1 tournament environments, that is also true. It's just that socializing happens uh, between. In, be in between games. Right. right. It's that you're all there to hang out. You're having a good time. You play Magic for a while. You stop playing Magic when the game is over. You talk to your friends that are there. Yeah. You become friends with everybody I, there. I think that was know? the most attractive part of Friday Night Magic. And I, yeah. not, I haven't experienced Friday Night Magic, but when I went to Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments or Duel Masters or whatever game I was playing at the time... Uh, the in-between rounds or the before and after tournament moments with these different people that are all sort of into the same thing you're into, that was like the the best experience. That was where you're socializing. You feel like you can connect with people. Um, whereas, you know, wherever you were, work, environment, your other life outside of this, you know, card store that's local to you, yeah. no one else cares about Yu-Gi-Oh! So you're like, <laughs> so finally I can talk about right. how busted Pot of Greed is or whatever. Yeah, and, and like that's something... <clears throat> that I think I miss most about Friday Night Magic is that I got to know people that I never otherwise would have gotten to know. Yeah. People from, you know, all different backgrounds and walks of life and, and different perspectives. And, um, you know, com Commander, uh, uh, I think, creates that sort of opportunity within friend groups to uh, have something that, that sort of breaks the ice in yeah. terms of like, okay, well, maybe some of us are socially awkward, but we have this game here that will that will sort of facilitate the social interaction. Yeah. Whereas I think, yeah, I've met quite a few people now. I think through one person in our pod asked if their friend could come and join the sure. pod, right. and then suddenly they might have a friend, and like it's just grown mm -hmm. like that. And it's these little, almost these little microcosms of what Friday Night Magic kind of used to do, but right. now you're doing it within your own whereas your own spaces in a one v one environment. If it was only one v one. You could have a friend that gets invited, but then they could not be good. Like, and so, <laughs> or they just like, they don't play the game right. for the same reasons. Right. And so you have someone there that just stomps them and then they're like, I don't really feel like playing with you anymore. It, 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 the, the, the interaction with the game, I think was much different. Cause when I'm thinking about the times when I would play casually yeah. in one V one, it was, you know, me and one other friend, right. Yeah. It wasn't much, there wasn't much room for like, all right, well let's, let's invite m more right. people to the space. It was more like, Oh, it's lunchtime at school or whatever. We're going to have a one V one game real quick. Yeah. And the other context was Friday night magic in which it was competitive focused. We're here to play the game. We're here to win. Uh, and you know, have fun, but like you know, the the main focus for at least my group was trying to to win the the night or whatever. Right. Uh, and then the socializing was happening outside of the game. So you know, at the end of the conversation here, with these things that Commander has sort of brought to the forefront of game design, how do we think this ch ends up changing game design going into the future? 
Um, I think we've already seen the early signs of it. Um, we're starting to see a lot more games designed with the ability to be played in a multiplayer format. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, companies and designers right now that are looking at the success of Commander and Battle Royales as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're seeing this sort of changing of the tie. They're seeing, oh, well, on average, people play games with about four friends or five friends or whatever. Right. And so they're starting to sort of design for this environment that allows you to play in that way. Um, so I, we're already seeing it. Um, and I don't think it's a bad thing to aim for. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that we are missing though, is, uh, that uh, what we're talking about with Friday night magic, where it's like, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that there's some ability for you to be able to bring new people in as well. Right. Not just always be enclosed with your friend group. Right. You're um, sort of like hoping that through word of mouth, one group ends up spreading to another group ends up spreading to another group. Yeah. And we're seeing things like command fest and whatever. And, and like the game store, I, I think you bring up a good point in that. Like, where does the game store fit in now? Right. Because that was, sort of like how that, I do think that TCGs in general owe a lot to the local game store and without a local game store what does this space end up looking like well and some players you know? rely on a local game store um, just to, to play it all to play it all yeah. and to meet other people that are interested so right. without that you're just I, I guess you'd go on social media but that's yeah, gross you, yeah I mean you could yeah yeah I I I do, I do question, yeah, okay, are we are we seeing, like, the the local... This is probably a whole other conversation, but uh, the local game store as a hub, right? It used yeah. to be the hub. It used to be that's where you would go to you to, to play the game the most. Yeah. You'd, you'd play games here and there with your friends at lunch or whatever, like I said, but, like, Friday Night Magic was the big, like, okay, once a week, that's the most ga games I'll be playing. Right. Where, you know, Commander now is so siloed at home. And I do wonder, you know, moving forward, like you said, how do we connect those dots better? So. Right. 